that ghostly blue glow that you're seeing there is called Cherenkov radiation. And it's basically a sonic boom, but for traveling faster than light rather than traveling faster than sound. Now, how does that make any sense? Nothing can move faster than the speed of light, right? Nothing can move faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. But when light's traveling through a medium, like the water in that tank, it slows down quite a bit. And in a big nuclear reactor like that, you can absolutely have particles that travel through that medium faster than the light can. And when that happens, it produces that eerie blue light that we call Cherenkov radiation. And it is freaky as hell to think about, man. So I'm sitting here studying, and I grab a bag of chocolate pretzels to snack on while doing so, and they're all just nasty and gray and weird looking. This is called fat bloom. It happens because they make these chocolates with a bunch of cocoa butter, and then when they're shipping them, they don't store them properly, and they get really hot and cold and hot and cold all over and over and over again, and the cocoa butter will, like, leak out of the chocolate and solidify on the surface, and that's where you get this slimy look. You can also do the same thing with sugar. If moisture gets around the chocolate, some of the sugar can leak out and form, like, a crystally structure on the top, and that's where you get that kind of dusty, ashy appearance. None of this is harmful. It's still totally edible, and it's not going to hurt you in any way. But holy crap, does it look unappetizing. And even though I know intellectually that I, I can eat this and be just fine, oh, I just can't bring myself to do it. Ugh. You don't eat more. Where is more shit coming from? There's more poop. Hey there, I'm a biologist. Two things, or three things actually. First of all, the hormones that cause contractions so that your uterus can shed its inner lining and your body can flush out those old eggs and start cooking up some new ones. Some of those also cause your intestines to not process and extract nutrients from food properly. And so everything just flushes through you. So you're right, you're not eating anymore. It's just that the wait time between eating and pooping is significantly reduced. That can also cause diarrhea in a lot of people, and that's where you get the period poops. Second thing, there's an old wives' tale that your uterus like doubles in size during your period, and that it's taking up more room in your abdomen, and there's no room for poop, and that's what's called... That's not true. None of that's accurate. There is swelling, of course, but your uterus doesn't grow nearly as much as people seem to think that it does. And finally, third thing, why can't we talk about this? Half the population goes through this. Why is this supposed to be some sort of uncomfortable conversation for me? I feel like garbage. It's just my allergies, but it's got me thinking about how fevers work. You see, increasing your body temperature makes it more difficult for bacteria to reproduce. It also causes the production of heat shock proteins, which, among other things, slowly cell production of viral proteins. So overall, it just stops whatever pathogen you got in you to make more of itself. They're so effective that for a long time, doctors would actually deliberately infect syphilis patients with malaria, because malaria is very treatable, and it causes a high fever which would kill the syphilis. All mammals, a lot of birds, some invertebrates, and even some plants get fevers. Trouble is, it takes about the same amount of energy as 20 minutes of sustained jogging to raise your body temperature even one degree, so get plenty of rest, okay? This is a great question, because what you're doing here is you're looking at the monotremes, the egg-laying mammals, the platypus, the echidna, and you're comparing them to all the rest of the mammals in the whole world that all give live birth, and you're assuming that that makes them the weird ones. But you've got it backwards. They're not the weird ones for laying eggs. We're the weird ones for giving live birth. Because giving live birth has nothing to do with being a mammal. To be a mammal, all you need is mammary glands and fur. If you have hair and you lactate, that's what makes you a mammal. And for the first almost 100 million years of mammalian existence, we all laid eggs. It isn't until 125 million years ago that the first marsupials and the first placental mammals like us appear in the fossil record. So the platypus and the echidna, they're not weird for laying eggs. They are factory default settings. They're doing the same thing that their ancestors have been doing for 220 million years. We're the weird ones here. Every now and then, I'll post a video about the science behind some controversial topic. Race, gender, climate change, vaccines, you name it. And without fail, every single time that I do, I get at least two or three comments that say something along the lines of, I followed you because I like science, and now I'm unfollowing you because you're getting all political. And those comments always strike me as somewhat thoughtless. Because science itself does not have a political agenda. The data don't have any party ties. Reality is not, or at least should not be, 
a partisan issue. But it is that very nature of science, being so deliberately unbiased, that makes it a political thing. The pursuit of knowledge, the attempt to understand more about the universe in which we live, that is, at its very core, a political action. Because while we should never use our political ideologies to influence our understanding of science, we should always use our understanding of science to influence our political ideologies. After all, if there's one thing that we can all agree that we should be basing our votes on, it's reality, right? So when we tell you that the evidence is very clear, that human-caused climate change is real, and that it's causing devastating effects for people around the globe at this very moment, when we tell you that sex and gender and sexual orientation are three completely different things, not one of which is a binary, when we tell you that race is a social construct that has no real bearing in biology, when we tell you that vaccines are safe and effective and that they are saving lives, not one of those things is a political statement. So if your response to that is to say, yeah, I like science, but I don't like when it gets political, I would posit to you that you don't like science, and you probably never have. You just like stories. I love sushi, and one of my favorite things about sushi is the seaweed. Not because of the way that it looks or the way that it tastes. I like those things. They're fine. But because it's so much fun to think about. You see, seaweed isn't a weed. In fact, it's not actually a plant at all. It's a multicellular protist. It's algae. And that means that it is plant-like in a lot of ways, but it's also not plant-like in a lot of ways. Like how it does have chloroplasts and it lives through photosynthesis, but it doesn't have roots or leaves. It has holdfasts to secure it to the bottom of the ocean. And then the things that look like leaves are called blades and they absorb nutrients from the water in the same way that roots kind of would in plants on the land. What? Protists are in a kingdom all of their own because they're just so strange. And while there are plant-like protists and animal-like protists and fungus-like protists, they're all just beautifully weird and difficult to define and sometimes delicious. This is a great question. Zygo comes from the Greek word for yoke, like what you use to hitch two oxen together so that they can plow a field. So when you're talking about zygodactyl feet, which are what parrots have, that's referring to the H shape, because they have two toes in the front and two toes in the back, so it looks like a yoke. A zygote, a fertilized egg, that's referring to the hitching of two things together. You hitch together two oxen, you hitch together a sperm and an egg. I cannot express to you just how important it is to learn these Latin and Greek root words if you want to excel in biology. Like, it is so beyond helpful. The other half of that first word, zygodactyl, dactyl refers to digits. So I have a pentadactyl hand because I have five digits on it. If I had six digits, that would be a condition called polydactyly because poly means many. I have seriously forgotten to study for tests in college and still pass the test with flying colors because I just translated it. It is so immensely helpful to learn these words. This is an incredibly kind comment. Thank you so much. And it actually reminds me of a story. You see, I'm not a normal classroom educator. I'm what's called an informal educator, which means schools and colleges and libraries and camps and whoever else hire me to come out and do big flashy assemblies and stage shows or small little detail-oriented classes and workshops, whatever it takes to get people excited about science. And one day, many, many years ago, when I was working with primarily elementary age kids, I was hired to go teach a group of third graders about something or other, and we got way off topic. And one of the kids asked me how stars work. And we talked for a good 20, maybe 30 minutes about stellar nucleosynthesis and how supernovas happen and whether it's right to say supernovas or supernovae and why actually both are okay and how black holes form and where new atoms come from and what those new atoms can do all sorts of really advanced topics and here's the thing i don't think for one second that any one of those kids remembers a single thing that i said but i know for sure that they learned two very valuable science lessons that day number one they learn that there are answers to the big questions that they have. And number two, they learn that it's a heck of a lot of fun to find out those answers. And if somebody knows those two things, they are destined to be a scientist. No matter what, they are going to learn for the rest of their lives. So I encourage you to remember those lessons as well. I encourage you to allow yourself 
to be curious. Even if you know for sure that what you're learning is way above your pay grade. Even if you are 100% positive that you're not going to remember a word of what you're learning. Allow yourself to go find out those answers. And don't put yourself down for not knowing them in the first place. Because if you can remember that there are answers to these big questions, even if nobody knows it yet, the answer is still out there. And maybe you'd be the one to find it out and you could share it with the rest of us. And that it's a heck of a lot of fun to find out these answers. You will never stop learning.